Hi, I'm Chappington, and welcome back to Skrelliga. This is Chapter 9, talking about Skrelliga in the province of Massachusetts Bay. So as of 1688, Skrelliga was now administered as part of the Dominion of New England. Uh, this included not just modern-day New England, so, so Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, but it also included New York and New Jersey, at the time, New Jersey was actually East Jersey and West Jersey, and Massachusetts was divided into Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth. But all of those were slapped together into this one dominion. Trade restrictions with other colonies and European powers had been enacted for some time, but the enforcement stepped up dramatically. Agricultural taxation increased, and scrutiny of land records led to confiscation by English authorities. These factors led to a great deal of unrest in Skralica. There was no open rioting, but local authorities frequently stonewalled and resisted enforcement actions. The start of the Dominion's fall, though, began later that year with the Glorious Revolution in England, where William of Orange was invited to invade England to depose King James II and VII and become King William III and II. The ands there just refer to England and Scotland were separate, so there were different numbers for each of the crowns. Because news took a while to travel places back then, news of the revolution reached some individuals in New England by late March 1689, and an organized mob revolted against the Dominion on the 18th of April. Governor Edmund Andros and other officials were arrested by the mob, which led to the de facto end of the Dominion. Most of the New England colonies seized control for themselves and reverted to their previous governments. The revolt spread to New York, where Jacob Leisler led a rebellion in May, forcing the Lieutenant Governor Francis Nicholson to flee to England. And so, with both the governor and lieutenant governors out of power, the Skrelligan thing declared all of Skrelliga to be an independent colony under the English crown on the 3rd of July, 1689. At the time, King William III was busy in Europe due to the Nine Years' War, so there was no immediate English reaction. While Skrelliga still declared itself subject to the king, this Declaration of Independence from New York was done without permission of the Crown. So the legality of the move was questionable. The thing chose to elect a governor for the first time in its history, selecting Nikolai Ragnarsson. Just a quick note that Ragnarsson in this case is actually a family surname and not a patronomic. Patronomics were banned by the English government in 1678 by then-governor of New York, Edmund Andros, but this was difficult to enforce and repealed in 89 by Ragnarsson. Confiscated land was returned, trade restrictions removed, and laws were essentially reset to what they were in 1688. The independent government would remain in effect through 1691, when Governor Henry Slaughter, or Slaughter, I don't know how you pronounce that, uh, was appointed to rule New York and put down Leisler's rebellion. At this point, it was only a matter of time until English authority was reasserted. On the 7th of October, 1691, a new charter for the province of Massachusetts Bay was issued. It combined the colonies of Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth, along with islands south of Cape Cod, including Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, the Skralig Islands, and the present-day territories of Maine, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Uh, the last three were heavily contested by New France. William Phipps was appointed governor, and he ordered the exile of Governor Ragnarsson. This was a generous offer, considering that Jacob Leisler had actually been executed for his rebellion, uh, which was a punishment that Phipps found abhorrent. So Ragnarsson and some of his loyalists escaped to Acadia. Skralik County was now part of the province of Massachusetts Bay, and North Mee was transferred from York County, Maine, to Skralik County. Colonial leadership was much more involved than it had been due to three main reasons. The first, that the colonial capital was much closer. Boston was less than 100 miles away by sea, whereas New York was almost 200 miles as the crow flies, 
and much further by sea due to the need to go around Cape Cod. For reference in sensible units, 100 miles is 160 kilometers, so 200 is 320 kilometers. So it's just slightly under there. The second reason was Skrelica occupied a strategic position in the on and off conflicts with the French to the north, which were becoming more frequent. And third, the rebellions in Skrelica, New England, and New York meant that the Crown wanted to keep a closer eye on the northeastern colonies. While New York had been a mostly secular colony with relatively free practice of religion, even for non-Christians, the province of Massachusetts Bay was a merger of two Puritan colonies. The new government was more free than the previous Puritan governments, as freedom of worship was guaranteed for all non-Catholic Christians, and the voting franchise was changed from religious requirements to land ownership. However, the Congregational Church still had the Congregational Church being the official name of the Puritans. They still had a significant presence in the lower levels of the government, and a lack of protections for Catholics and worshippers of other non-Christian religions was a negative change. Um, So one thing we do have to talk about that I've kind of glossed over a little bit is the Skrelligan thing. So it was the main government of Skrelliga back in the 11th century, and it remained as the sole government all the way through 1598 at the start of Danish rule. So originally it was kind of like a council of the heads of households, and it morphed into an elected council where each town would nominate a set number of people to the thing, and that would make up the legislative body. In 1598, it lost its sovereignty, but it managed to remain as a powerless local council. This kind of ability to somewhat willingly cede power and still exist was crucial for its survival later, though, because when Sweden became the new colonial power in charge in 1645, the thing had the opportunity to take more power for itself. And then during the rule from New York, both Dutch and English, they managed to get more power, so there was a decent degree of autonomy. After the Declaration of Autonomy was shut down in 1691, though, the powers that the thing had gained over the last decades were quickly revoked. The thing wasn't entirely abolished due to its centuries-old presence and the desire to not provoke further revolt, but its power was rolled back to be an advisory council. In practice, it had less power than it had before because it was subordinate to the government in Boston, but Skrelligans were now able to send two representatives per town to the General Court of Massachusetts, the legislative body, uh, which did allow for some representation. This did present a new problem, though, for the thing, which is that if Skrelligan now had representation within Massachusetts, what was the purpose of the thing? Um, and this was kind of an unanswered existential question that persisted through the next several decades. It kind of just existed under its own inertia. So during the autonomous Skrelligan period and the beginning of the province of Massachusetts Bay, there was the Nine Years' War which broke out in Europe between France and the Grand Alliance, basically every other European power. This manifested in North America as King William's War, where war broke out between New France and the New England colonies. The Iroquois Confederacy was allied with the English, and there had been conflict with the French over the fur trade, and the Wabanaki Confederacy was allied with the French to help fight off the encroaching English English settlers. This indirect conflict became direct in 1688, when Governor Andros of New England plundered the home and village of Jean-Vincent d'Abadie de Saint-Castin. Don't really speak French, so I may have hopefully gotten that right. Uh, But he was a French officer and Abenaki chief on Penobscot Bay to the northeast of Skrelica. In retaliation, Castine and the Wabanaki Confederacy began raids along the border of New England and Acadia. While the claims overlapped, in practice, the border area was just to the north of Skrelica. This fighting escalated in 1689 with English raids on Acadia and further French and Abenaki raids on Maine. And this led to the second raising of North Knee in late August. 
The attacks continued back and forth, including the Battle of Falmouth, that's present day in Portland, Maine, in 1690, and the aftermath of that left Maine compl- almost completely depopulated of English settlers. And then the Battle of Port Royal, the capital of Arcadia, happened later that year. Skrelga attempted to remain neutral throughout the conflict, but it was brought into the fray once it merged with Massachusetts Bay in 1691. Combined French and Abenaki forces, mostly from the continent, attacked and burned down Eaglestead in February of 1692, then continued down to Abenaki Borough. After some fighting, the fort still stood, many villagers had been killed or captured, and the casualty count on the French and Abenaki side was high. The Skrelligans did not have sufficient strength in their militia to launch any counteroffenses, but defenses were improved enough to ward off future raids. After a few years of an uneasy ceasefire on Skrelga and continued fighting on the continent, the war in both Europe and North America came to a close with the Peace of Ryswick in 1697, declaring status quo antebellum. Eaglestead was rebuilt with a fort in 1697, and Northney was rebuilt again in 1698, but that piece would barely last five years. One question had been looming over Europe for the past few decades, and that was who's going to inherit the Spanish throne and its territories. King Charles II of Spain was in ill health throughout his life, was possibly due to just the high level of Habsburg inbreeding. Like, it was a lot even for European royalty. But King Charles II had been living longer than anticipated. Uh, But still, he died without children on the 1st of November, 1700. And the fight over his territories turned into the War of the Spanish Succession in July, 1691. The English and the French wanted to keep their own North American colonies neutral, but the colonies had other ideas, they had their own grievances with each other. The English population greatly outnumbered the French at this point, mainly because the the English colonies were much more of a, a settler economy where more people would come in and farm or trade, whereas the French were mainly focused on the fur trade, which didn't need nearly as many people. And so the the English population growth They continue to encroach on Abenaki territory, and the Peace of Ryswick hadn't really dealt with anyone's conflicts with each other, and just kind of put them on pause. So the the war in Europe gave them an excuse to also go to war in North America, where it was known as Queen Anne's War. So as in the last war, the French encouraged many Native Americans to launch raids against the English colonies including an infamous one on Deerfield, Massachusetts in 1704, where many settlers were captured as slaves, both for ransom and adoption into Mohawk families. These events shocked the English settlers, even if they were expected by some due to the war. Not that the English were morally right here at all. They attempted to raid settlements in revenge, but they were usually empty when they arrived. They managed to get tipped off. So after three years of sporadic skirmishes and truces, the Massachusetts Bay government issued an ultimatum to the Abenaki and Skrelica. Assimilate and recognize the British sovereignty, leave the islands, or face capture and death. Most Abenaki chose to stay put. At this point, most of those who had any intention of assimilating into Skrelica had already done so. They had centuries to do so. And so... A Massachusetts militia marched up the shores of the Siguan River towards the main Abenaki settlement north of Eaglestead on the 14th of March, 1708. A bloody battle ensued with high casualties on both sides, but at the end of the day, the Massachusetts forces had destroyed most of the village and forced the survivors to flee into the surrounding woods. The forces established a new fort and settlement named Bradstreet for the former governor, some Abenaki continued to live up in the mountains and occasionally came into conflict with the Skrelligans, but the loss of their main village was devastating. Many fled across Casco Bay to the continent, and the Abenaki would never recover from the disaster. Queen Anne's War continued into 1712, and the peace was finalized in the 1713 Treaty of Utrecht. After capturing the southern portion of Acadia, which they renamed Nova Scotia, Britain was awarded Acadia, Hudson Bay, and Newfoundland. 
France had contested the specifics of the agreement, interpreting that Britain was only given the lower Acadian Peninsula, so they de facto retained control of the northern portion, modern-day New Brunswick. This treaty completely ignored any of the Native Americans, so Governor Dudley of Massachusetts Bay and New Hampshire, uh, they were separate colonies, but they had the same governor at that point, he signed the Treaty of Portsmouth with the Eastern Abenakis on July 13th of 1713. One common underhanded, let's say, tactic of British treaties at the time and much of their colonial history was to hide some of the most disagreeable parts in just the English version. So this treaty was no different. The English version had the Abenaki ceding their sovereignty to the British crown, but the Abenaki later argued that this was not in the verbal translations given at the time. Uh, but at any rate, the British f failed to fulfill their obligations in the treaty anyway, including setting up official trading posts at fair values, and conflict would continue through the following decades, including Dummer's War from 1722 to 25. So Skraliga continued to grow in population during all this time, both in natural growth and in immigration, while growth in Skrelbra and the surrounding area was not as substantial as in Boston, for example. It was growing faster than at any point in its history, and combined with a more hands-on government, there were several new buildings and services added. Uh, so the first one of note is the Skrelbra Synagogue. The first Jews to have immigrated to Skrelica came around 1684, when it was part of New York. At the time, Jews were not allowed to publicly practice their religion in New York. Rhode Island was the only colony where this was allowed. But they were allowed to freely live, trade, and travel, which led to a small group moving to Skrelborough. When it became autonomous in 1689, they gained the freedom to practice publicly, 
and built a small temple in the city in 1690. This presented a small issue in 1691, where the laws of Massachusetts Bay did not give any protections to Jewish people. Colonial officials were divided on whether to take over the temple, but they reached a compromise where they'd be able to stay as long as they didn't do so publicly. What this specifically meant was left up to interpretation. And so in practice, services would continue in secret and local authorities rarely investigated. Improved education was also a major priority of the new government. Scrubborough Latin School was established in 1698 and it's the oldest public school in Skrelica. It's based on the same philosophy as Boston Latin School, which was established in 1635. The Latin School movement holds that the classics, especially Latin, are the basis of a proper education. This was probably Massachusetts's earliest influence. It was much like New York and the other middle colonies. Education was mainly private and religious. Then for higher education, Phipps College was established in 1701, just across the river from Scrabborough in Northstead. It's named after the former governor of Massachusetts. It was sort of an Anglican counterpart to Harvard, which was de facto a Puritan school. It was sort of the artifact that at the time, there was a bit of a power struggle between the Puritans who had been around since the foundation and the Anglicans, the Church of England, back in England. That's why there were two colleges in the province rather than like there was wouldn't have been any need for more than Harvard College otherwise. There was also the new cemetery, which, with the future plans to expand it, is now becoming known as the Necropolis. And then one of the other nearby expansions was the town of Ragnarsson, which was just up the coast uh, from Northstead, so like kind of like around, there's like a cape that juts out or more like a peninsula, and then further north from there. It was named after the governor of Autonomous Skrelliga, which was somewhat contentious, but they managed to get away with it. This was the first settlement on the northwestern coast of the island. In addition to Ragnarsson and Bradstreet, there were three other towns built in the aftermath of Queen Anne's War. At first there was Thorfall, also known as Thorfjall, for the nearby mountain, and that was built in 1721 to the northeast of Littlevik. North Bay was built on the northern coast of Storain in 1724, and some of the improved Abenaki trails connected it across mountain passes down to Bradstreet and the rest of the Sigwon River Valley. It also did a better job of connecting North Knee to the rest of Skrelliga. And then South Fall was built on the southern end of Middelsen in 1731. 
The thing commissioned another census in 1740 for the Skrylik Islands. Massachusetts as a whole was resistant to taking a census. It didn't really think it would be that useful, and it was suspicious that British authorities would use this data against them. But Governor Jonathan Belcher, the governor is now being appointed by the Crown, was happy to allow a census of the islands to take place. Massachusetts itself wouldn't actually conduct a census until 1764. And the main results were that Skrelborough increased by about 700 people, and the islands in total went from just under 3,000 to 4,941 people. That's since the last census in 1684. We'll end this chapter at 1740. As you may know, there's some bigger wars and then a whole revolution coming up. Um, but that'll be chapter 10. Um, so until then, thanks for watching and have a good one. Mm -hmm.